ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار او بريز از دو تو الله وي بريز الله سبحانه وتعالى وي سيك الله اسيستنس and we ask for Allah's forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from our evil souls and our bad deeds verily whomever Allah guides to Islam no one can lead astray and whomever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance then no one can guide now bear witness that there is no deity worthy of our worship except Allah alone with no partners and I bear witness and testify the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and his messenger may allah send his peace and his blessings upon him may allah exalt his mention that of his companions and all those who follow them on their righteous path until the day of judgment allah says interpretation of the meaning in english all you who all you who believe have taqwa of allah the way he deserves it and do not die except as muslims Allah says all oh mankind fear your lord who created you from a single soul adam and from him created his partner eve and from them dispersed many men and women upon earth us those who came before us and those who will come after us and fear allah to whom you demand your mutual rights and reverence the wombs that bore you or keep your kinship ties don't break off the family ties verily allah ever watches over you Allah also says all oh, you who believe have taqwa of Allah and say a good word he will help you establish good deeds and he will forgive you your sins and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has attained the greatest success as to what follows the most truthful speech is the Quran the book of Allah and the best way of life and guidance and the best example to be followed is that of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the worst of affairs are the ones that we introduce into this deen of ours because every newly introduced matter is an innovation every innovation will lead astray and if we are astray we'll be going to the fire brothers and sisters in islam what is a lifeboat a lifeboat is a small boat that you find aboard a ship a big ship usually the the unique thing about this boat is that it is used in cases of emergency and it cannot accommodate many people it cannot fit many people so there's the elite those who are chosen usually those who have an agreement with the owner of the trip or the ship and things of the sort that in the case of emergency or if the ship was to drown then these individuals will be will be saved and will be given the priority to ride these lifeboats in in order to save their lives means of survival in cases of emergency and this is exactly what we will be dealing with tonight those people on the boat and I don't mean we're going to be having a lesson or a lecture about sailing 
and how to sail and how to survive in case a boat was to, uh, a ship was to sink or something of the sort. Obviously that's not what I'm talking about. This is again symbolizing. These particular titles symbolize something that is deeper. And I will tell you what it symbolizes in this case. Now a ship is usually in the ocean. And the ocean symbolizes all of the different religions and ideologies and philosophies upon earth. And the thing that usually happens when you are in the ocean is drowning. That which is in the ocean drowns. Unless you have some means of survival. And that is the truth. So because of the lack of, the, lack of availability of the truth, whatever is in the ocean will drown. And everything you see in this life is drowning. And the ship is a slab. The only thing that floats, the only thing that is moving, the only means of real survival is this ship like the, no, like the Ark of Noah. When everything will drown, that's the only way you will be able to make it to your destination. And that is Islam. Any other religion, any other understanding, any other way of life will be in the ocean. Unless you get on the boat, you're not going to get to your destination. But then, we have to further explain this. Let's elaborate then what about the lifeboat? What is the need for the lifeboat? The reason why there's a lifeboat, because even the ship, at times, if the people who are aboard the ship do not take care of it properly, it may face some problems. It may face some problems up to the drowning point. Unless some individuals will go for backup, they will go for assistance, for help. And these are the elite who will be entitled to ride and get on these lifeboats, do whatever is necessary for this boat, for this ship, the ship of Islam, to remain sailing in the oceans. So these individuals must have some characteristics that are not available within the rest of the people who are aboard the ship. They are special. They have something extra. They have some contract, agreement that enabled them to be able to ride this lifeboat when everybody else had to be stuck on the ship with possible drowning and destruction and other things. So then, what are we basing this on? We're basing this on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said بدأ الإسلام غريبا وسيعود بدأ الإسلام غريبا وسيعود غريبا كما بدأ فطوبى للغرباء قالوا من هم يا رسول الله من هم يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الذين يصلحون إذا فسد الناس the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said in authentic narration which has more than one wording, we will deal with, with them insha'Allah He said, Islam began as something strange It was strange in the beginning It was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wa arda and Uthman and the early, early, early companions who believed in the Prophet sallallahu and supported him while everybody else was in the ocean They were those that were special, they were the elite and they were strange when people were worshipping the sun and the moon and the idols and the statues and all kinds of things and Jesus and the angels and what have you there were only a few people on earth worshipping Allah that was the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, his companions and that was how Islam was strange he said والسلام, and he will go back to being strange Meaning at some point in time, this will not be the case. Which was that area of the, the three generations where Islam spread. And many people upon earth were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in truth. And kufr was not as readily available as it was before the advent of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So he said Islam will go back to being strange the same way it began. Then they said, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, they were always seeking knowledge. 
They were always trying to learn. So when he said that, you know, uh, please turn off your cell phones. That could have been sufficient for him to say Islam began strange and it will go back to being strange. Fatuba lil Quraba. He said, so give glad tidings to the strangers. Now, Tuba is also a tree in Jannah where the person will walk under the shade of this tree the distance, the time of a hundred years. This, this tree in Jannah, you walk for one hundred years, you'll be only under the shade of this one tree, Tuba. But according to many scholars, Tuba is more general. It includes the tree and any good tidings, any glad tidings. So he said, Fatuba lil Quraba. Now here the companions had to ask, Qalu manhum ya Rasulullah, who are they? How do we recognize them? How do we identify them? In other words, how can we be among them? Because of course they want to be the, on the top of the list. He said, those who correct, those who correct when the people become corrupt. Those who correct when the people become corrupt. In another narration, he said, those who rectify my sunnah, when the people who will come after will destroy it. Those who rectify my sunnah, they will correct my sunnah when the people will abandon it. Those who will come after. In another narration, different wording of the hadith, he said, there are a small group of people among an evil population. Those who oppose them are more than those who will follow them. A small group of people among an evil population. Those who oppose them are much more than those who follow them. So they will be followed by few and they will be opposed by many. And this is the lifeboat. The strangers. And we should seek and strive to be these particular strangers. And the only way we can do that is if we understand the second part of our shahada. We dealt last time with the conditions of La ilaha illallah. I'm sure those who attended remember them, inshallah. Tonight, we will be dealing with the conditions of the shahada that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. You may say, but you know, we all believe in that. Otherwise, I will not be sitting here. I will not be a Muslim unless I believe in La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We say, time out. That, that is not enough. That is only knowing something. Then we said the next level after knowing is understanding something. Then after understanding there must be implementing. Knowing, understanding, implementing. We may have the first two. We may have one of the two. We don't necessarily have the third. And our focus and emphasis is on the third. You must truly know. Now before I go on with this lecture, I want each one of us honestly and seriously to evaluate himself according to the conditions of the shahada and see are we among the strangers or not each one will judge himself no one will judge you you judge yourself by the time I'm through bi'idhnillah you, you qualify yourself are you among the strangers who really follow these conditions of the shahada or are we just bystanders huh, on the top of the ship with the rest of the masses who may drown, may fail, and may not necessarily be saved when it is essential that you have means of survival. In these days, in these days we're living fitna, trials and tribulations, hardship, people calling to disbelief. Not only they are disbelievers, but they strive to give da'wah to their disbelief. Innovators call to their innovation. And the Muslim Ummah is in a very sensitive situation. And we are living during this era. We are li living during this time. And we will be held accountable on the Day of Judgment according to how we dealt with the situation we were in. And we have no choice, my brothers and sisters in Islam, but to, me, but to be among the strangers. We want to be among these strangers. And these strangers, the very thing that they have is very basic. They rectify the Sunnah when the people will abandon it. They follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the people tell you, Ya Akhi, this is unimportant. This is just a sunnah. This is only voluntary. You don't have to do this. Huh? When the people will make you have zuhd, become ascetic, 
about the Sunnah. The Sunnah, unimportant. We only follow the Quran. These people are very much available today and we will be dealing with them as we deal with the conditions of the Shahada that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. So what is the first condition? The first condition is تصديقه فيما أخبر صلى الله عليه وسلم That you believe every single thing that the Prophet وسلم said pertaining to the Sharia, pertaining to the law, pertaining to the future events that will take place. Because he did tell us about things that will happen. Among them is this hadith. Islam began as strange and it will go back to being strange. Now some people misunderstand and they think that the Prophet ﷺ has knowledge of the unseen, has knowledge of the future and this is batil, this is falsehood. He وسلم, does not know the unseen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him some knowledge about some of the events that will happen. Why? What's the benefit of that? Many among them is this is a proof. This is a proof and to affirm that he is indeed the messenger of Allah. Because when he said something 1400 years ago and then you read it in a narration and you are living it today, you say, I believe this is the messenger of Allah. He, he was given this information from Allah. You see the manifestation of the prophecy, this will increase your iman. This is among the benefits, but not, not all of the benefits. So he had some knowledge of the unseen that Allah gave him, but he was limited to that. He does not know the unseen in an ultimate sense, so he is not to be worshipped in this sense, as some may do in this day and time among the Muslims, may Allah rectify the condition. So why do we believe him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding everything that he said? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Surah Al-Najm, which everyone may know, Allah says, describing the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa in huwa illa wahyun yuha. He does not speak of his own desire. It is only revelation that it is being revealed to him. An inspiration that he is receiving. He's being inspired. He is receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything that the Prophet ﷺ said is from Allah. It is not from his own mind because Allah gave us this testimony in the Quran. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He does not speak of his own desire. He does not speak of his own desire. So you must believe him because some people today don't do that. For example, the narrations that deal with the fly. Maybe you have heard about the narration of the fly that if it lands in your food or your drink, you should dip it in. Don't just tell it you know, to fly away, dip it in. He said because in one wing there's the disease, the bacteria, and in the other one there's the cure, the treatment. Now, many people say, but he wasn't a doctor. I mean, I believe in whatever he says regarding, you know, Salah and Zakah and Siyam and Hajj and what have you. But Malish, this is not his field. You have some Muslims saying this. Say, so I really will not believe this until science proves it. Huh? When science proves it, it becomes a scientific fact, okay, then I will believe. We will say, you have a problem with your shahada that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He does not speak of his own desire. This is given by Allah. Even if science prove otherwise, and this can never be the case because Islam is always in agreement with science, then we will accuse science before we accuse the sunnah. Because how often did they think something and then find out a few hundred years later that they were wrong? Oh, well, the earth was flat. Oh, excuse me, no, it's round. So they, they don't know anything that is for sure. They only assume, then they discover. So they may say no, and then you know, 500 years later when the microscope becomes even more sophisticated and with more studies, they realize, oh, oh yeah, the flight, oh yeah, this is real. So we don't wait for science, huh? We take the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu face value. What he said, we believe. We must have this quality. When he tells you, مَا أَسْفَلَ مِنَ الْكَعْبَيْنِ مِنَ الْإِزَارِ فَفِي النَّارِ This hadith is narrated by Abu Hurairah, it's in Sahih Bukhari. Whatever is below the ankles from the lower garment of the man will be in the hellfire. Some brothers don't believe. They, I've heard this. So you're going to tell me, Allah will put me in the fire because of my pants? That's what the brother said. He said, you're going to tell me Allah will put me in the hellfire because of my pants? I pray five times a day. I do this, I do that. He started praising him. 
himself. Allah will put me in the fire because of my pants? Yeah, you think the Prophet is playing with you? You think when he was saying this narration, he, what was he trying to say? You either believe or you don't believe. Now if you are taking some fiqh position of some of the scholars, which is not the right position, that it's okay if you're not doing it out of arrogance, then this is half a problem. But to sit there and negate the hadith with your intellect is, some, is an indication that this person does not really believe. Otherwise, what is expected upon a Muslim who wants to be among the stranger is not even to negotiate. Don't sit there looking around to see one, one imam, one faqih who says, well, if you're not doing it out of arrogance, then this is okay for you. Say, oh, this is my madhab. Okay, this is what I follow. So, I don't need to follow the sunnah. Disregarding tens of other narrations that the Prophet ﷺ indicated that a man's pants should never be below his ankle. And this one is the least severe one, which is the fact that it's in the fire. And another one he said, Allah will not look at him on the day of judgment, nor will Allah speak to him, nor will Allah purify him. And he will have a severe punishment, the one who drags his pants out of arrogance. So they said, I'm not arrogant. That he will say to you, I'm not arrogant. Because Abu Bakr Siddiq, when the Prophet said this hadith, he said, Ya Rasulullah, O oh Messenger of Allah, you know, ata'ahaduhu. I'm struggling with my pants. I keep trying to lift them up, but they fall down. Huh? What did the Prophet tell him? You're not doing it out of arrogance. So he gave tazkiyah to who? Abu Bakr Siddiq. You find a brother who says, I'm like Abu Bakr Siddiq. Did you get this tazkiyah from the Prophet I don't think so. Did Abu Bakr say, Wallah, I went to the tailor, O oh Messenger of Allah, and I made my pants long? No. He said, Ata'ahadu, I'm struggling with it. He was skinny. And they didn't have a belt, like you have a belt today, you know, you go like this, put it in the last hole, and no problem. They had a rope. They used to tie rope stones around their stomach because of hunger. His condition was a such where his pants were falling unintentionally. And he said that to the Messenger of Allah, he said, you, you're not trying to do this out of arrogance, your pants are falling down. Now everybody takes this hadith and he gives the tazkiyah for himself and he disqualifies himself from the hadith of the Prophet that is in Bukhari, says that I am, I'm not one of these akhi. We say, that's not the quality of the strangers. You, you, you probably will not make it to the lifeboat. If you really want to be among the strangers, you will not even ask. Is this a sunnah? Is it a wajib? Is it a fard? Is it what? Don't worry about it. Ya akhi, do. Do what they did. What did the companions do? They did. When he said, they did. They didn't negotiate with him. Oh Messenger of Allah, is this a sunnah or are you just advising me? Do I have to do this? They didn't have these discussions. Now if you fall into a violation, you ask. If it's a sunnah, no problem. If it's a wajib, you have to do something to make it up, to expiate the sin. This is when you ask, or to learn, to become knowledgeable so you can give fatwa, you must learn what is wajib, what is, you know, mustahab, uh, and what is makruh, and what is muharram, and what have you. But for the believer, his attitude should be, sami'na wa ata'na. That's it. We listen and we obey. He said that whatever is below the ankles in the fire, I don't want to take a chance. I mean, do we know what the fire is? We, do we really understand, ya akhwan? Yeah, I mean, if I put some fire here, right now, put some, some gasoline and put some fire, I dare anyone here to come and put his hand here for 20 seconds, you will leave. You will not stay here. If I said everyone in here, whoever wants to remain for the lecture must put his hand here, everybody will leave. I will stay here by myself. And I will leave too. I will not put my hand either. Because there's a fire. But then we say, He's telling you, yeah, you may go to the fire, say, Mahmash, I am not me. I am praised. I am special. Subhanallah al azim This is an indication that we really don't understand the second part of the shahada, which is our whole life. We are given ourselves a position that Wallahi we do not have. Wallahi, one of the tabi'een said, I met 30. 30 of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, each one of them used to think he's a hypocrite. Munafiq. 30 of the companions. He said he thinks he's a munafiq. He's a hypocrite. Umar. He asked him, by Allah, when, when the Prophet ﷺ gave the name, Uzzir Abdurrahman Ma'awf, 
to Abdurrahman the Auf, he wrote, he said, write the names of the munafs, the hypocrites. So when they die, you don't pray for, you don't pray for them. Omar said, by Allah, I ask you, did he write my name with them? He told Omar, if the shaitan sees you on one side of the road, he goes to the other side of the road, man. He can't deal with you. He's asking him, by Allah, is my name among the list of the hypocrites? Now none of us thinks he's a hip- Maybe you would never think you're a hypocrite. But the companions did. They were crying all day and all night. And they were following the sunnah blindly. Because this is when you follow blindly. The sunnah. Nowadays we are exactly the opposite. And we think we already have a key to Jannah. We think our foot is already in Jannah. And Uthman used to say if I had one foot in Jannah and the other one outside, I will not guarantee that I will make it all the way in. Why? Because they were the strangers, Ya Akhwan. And we're not the strangers. We're not, unless we strive. I don't want to just put you down and put myself down. I'm the first on the list. I'm not just trying to make you depressed and leave this place, you know, go commit suicide. This is haram. What is intended, that we want to be the strange. You can do it. He said that he will go back to being strange. So he mentioned that these brothers will remain available. So we could, it could be me and you. So that's the intention. Believing him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without negotiating and, and, and using our intellect to negate and oppose the narration. If it's sahih, we will deal with that, inshallah. First condition. Second condition. Imtitalu amrihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That you obey him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's more than one verse. The first one is, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا It is not, now listen to this verse, maybe you've read it before, maybe you have not, maybe you read it but you didn't know the meaning, maybe you read the meaning but you didn't reflect. Now let us reflect. This is the statement of Allah. And we said in the beginning of this lecture what? Huh? أَمَّا بَعَدْ فَأَنَّ أَصْدَقَ الْحَدِيثِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ The most truthful of speech is the book of Allah. He said, Allah said, It is not for a believing man or a believing woman. Both. Just in case someone thought it was only for the man. It is not for a believing man or a believing woman. After Allah and His Messenger have decided regarding a matter, decided regarding any matter of the deen, do's and don'ts that the believer man or woman will have a choice regarding that no choice no choice reality because Allah says ma kana li mu'minin this is if you're a believer if you're a believer you will not have a choice wa man ya'si allaha wa rasoolahu faqad dalla dalala mubina and whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger has went far astray clear mubin clear Dalal, astray, misguidance, deviance. So where are we from this verse? Do we have a choice? Don't we very often inject our choice into what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger have decreed? Indeed we do. They decide and we decide. And we let the choice go for our decision. And I don't want to give too many examples in order not to stir emotions and cause more problems than what is intended. We intend goodness here, so I don't want to cause problems. But the, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. I'm sure you know some of the things that I'm trying to hint at. Without me having to you know, label them for you and, and put them out there. You know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm speaking everything regarding your life as a Muslim. Every single thing that came from the Prophet ﷺ. It is not for believing man or woman. Allah says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يؤمنون. Look, these verses, yani, subhanallah al-azim, they're so, they're so powerful in the meaning, so direct in their intent, they are going straight to your heart. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يؤمنون. لَا يؤمنون. حَتَّى يحكموك. The Messenger وسلم, فيما شجر بينهم. ثم لا يجدوا في أنفسهم حرجا مما قضيت ويسلموا تسليما. Listen to this one. If you didn't, if the first one was a little light, check this one out. Allah says in the Quran, Nay, no. Negation. By your Lord. Allah swearing by Himself. By your Lord, yani your Lord, O Muhammad. Sallallahu They shall not believe. They shall not believe. You will not be a believer until you do three things. Three things. The first, Hatta yuhakimuka fima shajara Until they make you a judge. 
regarding every dispute that they have. So whenever we have a problem, huh, am I supposed to do this or not? Where do we take it? To the Sunnah. Of course, the Quran and the Sunnah. You must take it to Allah and His Messenger, which is the Quran and the Sunnah. Not to this Imam or this Sheikh or this philosopher or this doctor or this whoever. Because very often people, like, they like to take it from elsewhere. Say, so, you know, I'm sorry, but Professor, uh, you know, uh, A, B, C, D, F, G said that, you know, I should do this. Ya Akhi, subhanallah, you have the Quran and the Sunnah, everything you need is in there. Of course, we're dealing with the affairs of the deen. Not things that are not out of the, the dunya matters. You go to the people of expertise. We're not, we're not negating that. We're dealing with the affairs of the deen. Allah says, you will not believe until they make you a judge regarding everything that they dispute about. This is the first, le- first level. ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَدَيْتُ Then they do not find within themselves any discomfort regarding what you judge. So when you take it back to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and the ruling comes to you, if you find discomfort in your heart, then you, we are lacking Iman. Our Iman is not complete by the swearing of Allah Azza wa Jal in the Qur'an. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حتى يحكموك فيما شجر بينهم ثم لا يجدوا في أنفسهم حرجا no discomfort, no displeasure, no lack of ease rather you find ease مما قضيت and the last level ويسلم تسليما it may sound redundant because it is trying to emphasize something يسلم تسليما are both derived from the same root word استسلام which is both coming from a word that part of it is Islam, Islam is to surrender, to submit. وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا And they submit in total submission. You will not believe. So this is for the brothers and for the sisters. For the sisters, for example, so I will not be picking on the brothers only, hijab. A woman, a sister will not truly believe until she understands what is expected of her in terms of her dress code. Again, we will not be dealing with covering the face and the hands because we said this is an issue where the scholars have differed. I'm not dealing with the things that the scholars have differed about, but the things that the scholars have no difference about, which is the fact that a woman must cover herself in such a way where she is not a source of fitna for those who are strange to her. That, there's no no difference of opinion. A sister will not truly believe until she takes it back to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, how she's supposed to conduct herself as far as her dress code. Then after she knows that she's supposed to cover herself, she should not have any huh, discomfort. But I like to do this. But I like to wear, you know, golden rings and a golden watch. I like manicure and I like, you know, to wear this and this and things of the sort. Discomfort. It's not really, it's not, she's not really liking the legislation. It's opposing her desires. We say to the sister, Ya Ukhti, you don't really believe. You believe, but you're not on the boat and you may not make it to Jannah. You may not make it to Jannah. You may go through a phase first. And we said about the cup and the fire, I don't think any one of us want to take a chance. If you cannot put your hand in this cup of fire, then know that the hellfire is 69 times, as it comes in the hadith, 69 times more severe than the fire of the dunya. And the fire of the dunya is not the one that you use in your oven, it's the sun, the, the strength of the sun. Can you, you cannot even look at the sun. The sun is so far away from us and we complain all the time. Har, har, it's hot. Turn on the AC, huh? And where's the sun? Far away. Look, imagine if you touch the sun, that will be the fire of the dunya. Jahannam is time 69. So can a sister really take a chance to see well, how the hellfire is going to be so I live my life according to my desires. Although you're supposed to do imtithal al-amr, obeying the command, cover yourself, protect yourself, qarna fi buyutikun, remain at home when it is the, when it's the asl, of course there are times of necessity where the sister needs to go out to maybe earn a living, to handle her business, but the asl is that she's not hanging out at the mall every day. That's not the principle regarding the woman. That's not how they used to be. And if a sister wants to be a stranger, 
then she must be like the companions, the women, female companions, the same way they were strange. So we will not believe my brothers and sisters until we return it to the Quran and the Sunnah. Then we don't have any discomfort. You love it. And you, you could try this with any brother in the masjid. You can walk into the masjid huh, and see a brother sitting like this. This is called interlacing the fingers. There is a narration about the prohibition. I don't know if it's a prohibition of tahrim or karahiyah. Where there is only dislike or prohibited. Either way, you're not supposed to cross interlace your fingers while you're waiting for the salah. You come across two kinds of brothers. One who believes in this verse and is a real believer and one who is not. When you go to the first one, you say, Ya Akhi, Barakallah Feek. You're not supposed to interlace your fingers. What does he say? Or, Jazakallah Khairan, Barakallah Feek. Alhamdulillah, I didn't know. So if any time you see me, Ya Akhi, doing something wrong, Billah Alaik, tell me. When you see me doing something wrong, tell me, I don't know. I want to learn, I want to implement. That's one person. And you'll get another kind of brother. Who will look at you? Say, okay. Zakla. He still has his fingers interlaced. Were well, you playing with them? You think I'm playing with you when I'm giving you the hadith? Says, Ma'lish, I've been Muslim way longer than you. And this is, you know, what's the big deal? If I cross my fingers. And he will start, he will start, he will not really submit. Something in his heart, yes, he likes to cross his finger. The hadith goes against him, he has discomfort and he has no taslim. He doesn't submit. He will arrogantly remain and some people will lie. He will continue to do it every time you go to the masjid. On purpose. When he sees you, he put him back. He say, Inta, you, are you really play, are you playing with your deen? You really want to go to Jannah with this attitude? And I know inshallah no one here is like that. No one here is like that. But you know, these people exist. And for you to be a stranger, you have, they have to be the opposite of this brother. When the sunnah comes to you, don't negotiate. Imtithal <coughs> al-amr. Obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another word, another verse. Ya ayyuhal alladheena amanu istajeebu lillahi wa lirrasooli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. Oh you who believe, respond to Allah and His Messenger. When He calls you to that which will give you life. When, when, when you get revelation, when you get new teachings from the Quran and the Sunnah, this is your hayat. Lima yuhyikum. To that which will give you life. Which means that you may be alive but dead. You may be physically alive but spiritually dead. And many, many scholars and companions are physically dead but spiritually alive. We continue to speak about them until today. Until today you say Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu arda. What did Abu Huraira have? Did he, have? did he own a country? Did he have a big castle? Did he have many cars? Nothing. He used to be on the ground, flapping around, till they thought he was crazy. He said, Wallahi, there was nothing wrong with me except that I was hungry. I was only hungry. And the people thought I lost my mind. But you, until today, you say Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He didn't do anything for the dunya, but he memorized the hadith of the Prophet and he used to implement that in his life. Until today he is alive amongst us. No other man is mentioned. Tell me someone who people still speak about now. From any of these uh, people. No one is, everybody's forgotten. But this hadith, this Quran, this sunnah will give you life. It will give you life. People will continue to remember you until the day of judgment. So we should strive to be in this, like this. So respond to Allah's Messenger when they give you that which will give you life. When they call you to that which will give you life. If you, will, if you want the real life, it is in istijaba. Responding to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the hadith of Abu Huraira, speaking of Abu Huraira radiallahu it's in Bukhari. Again Bukhari, another man whom we often remember. Rahimahullah. The Prophet sallallahu said, this is a very strange narration by the way. Not strange, it's strange, you will see why it's strange. He said, كُلُّ أُمَّتِي يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ أَبَى He said, all of my ummah will enter Jannah. But the hadith doesn't stop. إِلَّا except مَنْ أَبَى Those who reject. Now the companions, again, 
because they were keen on learning it didn't make sense to them how can someone reject how can he said all of my ummah will enter jannah except those who reject he said وَمَنْ يَعْبَى يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ who will reject who is in his right brain who believes in Allah and his messenger will reject وَمَنْ يَعْبَى يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ مَنْ أَطَعَنِي دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَى he said whoever obeys me will enter jannah and whoever disobeys me then he has rejected so then a person may reject jannah although it is within his reach because of rejecting and disobeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam disobedience so it is a matter it is a serious matter that today many Muslims could care less about if you try to speak about the Sunnah you become an innovator if you try to speak about the Sunnah and you propagate the Sunnah say he's a Muqtada too much Sunnah too much Sunnah why too much Sunnah let go of some things this deen is easy you make things difficult for the people sunnah 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 subhanallah Look, did you ever think somebody will say these things towards sunnah since when there's too much sunnah and you want to enter jannah while you claim that there's too much sunnah and Allah knows how many sunnah we've abandoned let alone sunnah that we are implementing and living according with we've left many that they used to be very keen on today and with the li- very little that we practice some people still complain that there's too much sunnah Allah musta'an the third condition avoiding disobeying the Prophet ﷺ the first one is imtithal amr you obey the second ishtinabu ma naha anhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you avoid strictly everything that he told you to leave alone وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولِ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Whatever the messenger gives you, take it. And whatever he prohibits for you, leave it alone. وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Leave it alone. Stop. Desist. When he said don't do something, that means don't do something. Again, I am speaking regarding things that are obligatory because there are some voluntary things which you may leave alone but many Muslims have a misunderstanding they think anything that is related to the word sunnah is voluntary and this is a misconception listen to me not everything that comes from the sunnah is voluntary otherwise it is voluntary for you to pray the Lord for rakahs you may pray more why? because you only learn it from the sunnah do you have any verse in the Quran that says pray the Lord for rakahs? No? Where did you get it from? The Sunnah. Is it voluntary or obligatory? You say it's obligatory. So just because it came from the Sunnah, it doesn't mean it's voluntary. Sometimes this word is used by the Fuqaha to indicate that which is voluntary. Yani it is optional. If you do it, you'll be rewarded. If you leave it alone, there's no sin on you. But that does not mean that everything that is called Sunnah is optional. Otherwise there'll be no Zakah and no Siyam and no nothing. Because our whole deen is the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the Qur'an is broad and the Sunnah specifies. Allah says, Aqeemu salah Establish the salah. How do you know everything regarding the salah? From takbir al haram to the taslim, it's in the Sunnah. Our whole deen is explained through the Sunnah. So not everything is from the Sunnah, is voluntary. Now what I'm speaking about tonight is regarding the obligations. Now, I still recommend that we do not have this particular division Rather we follow whatever it is and we leave alone whatever, whatever it is Whether it is makruh or mustahab We take everything uh, as black and white We don't want this gray area in the, in the Quran and the Sunnah If it's, it says don't do it, don't do it If you want to have more knowledge, learn whether it is karahiya or tahrim Is it disliked? Or is it forbidden? Yes, you may learn. But I, I suggest and I advise myself and you, if we want to be among the strangers, then we don't have this particular criteria. Rather, whatever comes from commandments we do, whatever prohibitions, we also leave alone. There's a very dangerous verse in the Quran. If you have tafsir ibn Kathir, I'm sure you may have it in English or whatever language you speak. 
I suggest that you go back home at your own convenience and refer to this particular verse. Because this verse is very extensive in its tafsir and I do not have the knowledge or the time uh, if I had the knowledge to go over it with you right now. But I will just give you some, some brief points regarding the danger of disobeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the Quran فَلْيَحْذَرَ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Let those who oppose the Messenger beware that those who oppose the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam oppose his command Sallallahu beware be careful this is a threat from Allah what will happen? Huh? that they may be afflicted with a fitna or with a severe punishment Ibn, Kas- Ibn Kathir Rahmatullah Alayhi when dealing with this he mentioned that the fitna could be one of three things it could be nifaq hypocrisy that will grow in your heart or shirk Kufr, where you will leave Islam or Bid'ah, some innovation that you will be stuck with until you die. This happens when you disobey the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I'm going to quote to you a real, uh, a real life uh, incident, a real story that happened personally with me, with someone in another country. I'm not going to give you his name so we can avoid the whole backbiting problem because this is not our business. But I want to tell you something that perhaps will be a lesson for me and for you to understand the reality of this verse because I, have, I by the will of Allah, saw it, the implementation. I saw it take place in real life with a brother. This brother was the one who was teaching myself and some of the brothers around in the masjid in another country. He was teaching us Tajweed how to recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. He had some goodness in him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardon us and pardon him. But there was a little issue with this very, this very condition. Now, the Prophet ﷺ forbade that you cut the hair uh, in such a way, which is shaving a part and leaving the other, where you have a mushroom cut. You know, here it's bald, and then you just have some hair on the top. He, as a son, when he seen a child like that, he said, either leave his, his whole hair alone, or shave the whole thing. Don't do that. Now, this person knew this hadith. And one of these days, he brought his son to the gathering where we were sitting, and his son looked just like that. Just like the prohibition. And I told this person, Allah decreed that I'm the one who happened to have read this hadith. I, was, I didn't know anything. I was just reading from uh, Imam Nawawi at Riyadh al-Salihin. I came across the hadith and I just wanted to share it with him. I thought he did not know. I said, Ya Akhi, this, this, this haircut here has been prohibited by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You should not have this haircut for your son. And he basically gave me this nonchalant, careless attitude. I know. That's, that's what he did. That's it. There wasn't, uh, you know, he was older than me. He was the one teaching me. And, and I was very, you know, I'm very much, I'm not in a position to sit there and, and have a, you know, discussion with him, a, a knowledgeable discussion. I don't have any knowledge. So I said, خلص, I delivered the message and his affair is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rectified his condition. But from that day on, things were not the same anymore. The brother slowly but surely started to drift away. He used to be the first in the front row, early for the salah. Then, as the Prophet said, "Wala yazalu aqwamun yataakharun hatta yuakhiruhum Allah." There will remain a group of people who will continue to be late for the salah. <coughs> excuse me, until Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will cause them to stay behind. And this is a reminder for me and you, for those who always go to the salah uh, just before the iqama or after the iqama or praying with the second jama'ah and the salah is the last thing on, on the list of important things. We'll never try to be at the masjid at the right time. People will continue to delay and to be lack and slack regarding the salah until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep him behind. They will not catch up with those who are in the forefront. This brother, may Allah rectify my condition in his and yours, started to slowly but surely drift away. And I was seeing it with my own eyes and it is sad. There is nothing that you can do. 
And I remember thinking about this verse. I said, La ilaha illallah. فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Wallah, this is a fitna. A brother, imagine older brother, maybe on the verge of departing from this life. Maybe the, death, the angel of death is around the corner to take him to the next life. After he was teaching the Qur'an and then he's in the masjid and he's in a very comfortable position to enter Jannah. Suddenly all this slips away. Why? Because he's put his son, he gave his son a haircut that he knew he should have, shouldn't have. So I'm saying, we must be careful. These are things that happen. But the problem is, we don't pay attention. See, he may not feel. You see. He doesn't see. And it may be me and you. We may be just like him. But we don't know. We don't know that we're suffering from the disease. Maybe people around us, they see that. Huh? But we don't see. وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَنِ نُقَيِّدْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَصُدُّونَهُمْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ This is the calamity. Whoever turns away from the remembrance of Allah, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we will assign for him a devil. He will be his companion. And verily they will be misleading him from the path. And this is the point, the shahid. وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ But they think that they are rightly guided. The shaitan will be grabbing him by his hair to Jahannam. This is the path to Jannah. And the shaitan is taking him like this. Come here man. Come with me. He thinks, I'm rightly guided man. I'm going straight to Jannah. I'm going right on the right way. We don't know if we are that brother or that sister. How do we avoid all this? Don't disobey the Prophet ﷺ regarding the obligations. Regarding the obligations, don't disobey him وسلم, because when you obey him and you disobey him, you are obeying and disobeying Allah. Whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. And obey Allah and obey his messenger. Say so if you claim that you love Allah, then follow me, Allah will love you. Do I have to give you more verses? Aren't these sufficient for us? We're supposed to do what we are asked to do and leave alone what we are asked to leave alone in terms of obligation. Otherwise, we will not be among the strangers. This is not how they used to be. One or two of the companions, one of them, he would get pebbles and you know, just kind of, you know, flick him like that. The Prophet ﷺ had, had forbidden that. He said, don't do that. It, it doesn't benefit anything. You cannot hunt with it. It will only break a tooth or poke someone's eye or something along these lines. So then the companion told the other one, huh? He seen him do that. He said, the Messenger of Allah, told, he told him, the Messenger of Allah said, do not do that. And then the man continued to do it. He said, I tell you, the Messenger of Allah said, don't do it, and you continue to do it. Wallahi, I will never speak to you again. I will never speak to you again. I tell you, the Messenger of Allah said, don't do this. And you continue to do this, I will never speak to you again. This is again in the Riyadh al-Salihin. In the chapter about the importance of following the Sunnah. So then, ya akhwan, or akhwat, the affair is serious regarding disobeying him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We don't want to be that. Wamanahakum anhu, fantahu. He said, alayhi salatu salam, لا ألف ين أحدكم على أريكته يأتيه يأتيه الأمر من عندي فيقول ما أدري ما كان في كتاب الله اتبعناه. He said, do not let me find one of you reclining on his sofa. Arikatihi, his personal couch. Ma'alish, ba'deen ya akhwan, ba'deen. Barakallah fiqh habibi. Later inshallah, so we'll not be distracting. Barakallah fiqh, jazakallah khayran. He said, do not let me find one of you reclining on his sofa. Yani in an, in an arrogant attitude. And the command comes to him from me. And he will say, I don't know. Whatever I find in the book of Allah, then I will follow. Whatever is in the Qur'an, I will follow. Meaning, I will not follow the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't be this individual. Don't be this individual thinking you're going to go to Jannah with the Qur'an and the Qur'an tells you that you must believe in the Sunnah. The Qur'an tells you you must believe in the Sunnah, you must obey the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Fourthly, not to give any person's statement precedence over that of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Yani, I give you the hadith, you tell me, but Shaykh, 
the Sheikh said, huh? our Imam, the Imam of our Madhab said, this happened during the time of the companions. Regarding that, it was narrated, Ruyan ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu wa ardah wa an abih, annahu qal, yushiku, an tanzila, an tanzila alaykum hijaratun min as-sama, aqulu qala rasulullah wa taquluna qala abu bakrin wa umar, Ibn Abbas said, stones are about to fall upon you from the heavens, from the skies, like the Ashab al-Fil. I tell you, the Messenger of Allah said, and you tell me Abu Bakr and Umar said, now who is he talking about, Abu Bakr and Umar? And you're supposed to follow the Sunnah, alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat al khulafai al-Rashidid al-Mahdiyin, you're supposed to follow them, but not when it goes against the Sunnah of the Prophet he said, stones are about to fall on you from the sky. I tell you, the Prophet ﷺ said, you tell me Abu Bakr and Umar, and now we tell the brother, Ya Akhi, the hadith is in Bukhari. You tell me my Imam? What is your Imam? Who is your Imam? Whoever he is, no matter how much we love him, and respect him, and follow him, we can never make him compete with the Messenger of Allah wasallam. You don't give any person's statement precedence over that of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He is your Imam. He is your ultimate Imam and all the Aimma were trying to take you to him. So you take him as an Imam instead of him? This is a wrong decision and this is not someone who wants to be among the strangers. So when the Sunnah has been presented to one of us regarding of the Madhab which carries it, regarding of the Alim who gave fatwa regarding it, if the Hadith is Sahih, then upon you is the Hadith and you disregard the Imam, whoever he is. Imam Malik rahimahullah said this during his time. He was standing near the grave of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was standing near the grave of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said each one, each person, you could take from a statement and you could reject except, except the person in his grave. Speaking about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Each one of us, even the Imam, he said you take from me and you reject some of my speech. Because he is not infallible. He doesn't get wahi revelation, only the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu received revelation, so we follow him. Okay. Moving on, the fifth condition, the fifth condition of the shahada that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Messenger of Allah. Uh, not innovating anything into his deen. And this is a very sensitive door where many people have bypassed and transgressed against. People have seen that there's a partition here that says Bida, innovation, do not come in. And we have brothers going in at the speed of 100 miles per hour. They're trying to crash in to the door of innovation. Although there are many narrations which prohibit us from innovating anything into this deen. Because Allah says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم Today I have perfected your religion for you. And we've said this many times before, the Islam is perfect. When something is perfect, you cannot add anything anymore because it will no longer be perfect. If a car has four wheels, isn't that perfect for the car? But can you add a fifth one? It sounds nice, a car with five wheels, but that's not perfection anymore. Although it is adding, which may usually give you the impression that it is good, in this particular case, it is no good, because the car needs four wheels. Similarly, the sunnah, the deen, is perfect. There are times when adding is good, but not when it comes, when, not when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah told you that the deen is perfect. And I don't want to elaborate much on this point, although this one requires much elaboration. But it is sufficient to quote the hadith of Al-Ibad ibn Sariya radiallahu anhu, where he said, وَعَظَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ مَوْعِضَا ذَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْعُيُونَ وَوَجِلَتْ مِنْهَا الْقُلُوبِ قُلْنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ كَأَنَّهَا مَوْعِضَةٌ مُوَدِّعْ فَأَوْصِنَا قَالَ أُوصِيكُمْ بِتَقْوَى اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ تَمَسَّكُوا بِهَا وَعَبْضُوا بِهَا عَلَى النَّوَادِجِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمَحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مَحْدَثَةَ بِدْعَى إِلَى آخر الْحَدِيثِ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم العرباض المساريه said 
The Prophet of Allah وسلم, gave us an admonition, a reminder that caused the hearts to tremble and the eyes to shed tears. So we became concerned that this may be a farewell. We said, O oh Messenger of Allah, it is as if you are given us farewell, as if you are going to leave us. What do you advise us? What do you recommend to us? He said, upon you is the taqwa of Allah. And to listen and obey the one, who, the ruler, whoever is in charge. Even if it's an Abyssinian slave. He said, and because really whoever will live amongst you, whoever will live amongst you, then he will see a lot of difference. A lot of difference. People will change. People will take away the sunnah and put bid'ah instead. He said, though when you see that, upon you is my sunnah. And the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa, he said, hold on it and bite on it with your molar teeth. Now your molar teeth are the ones that are inside. He said, bite on it with your molar teeth, meaning don't, don't touch it with your finger, say, I'm going to grab onto the sunnah, that's not going to save you. Even holding it is not going to save you. You got to bite on it with your molar teeth. You have to be very strict. Very strict and serious about following the sunnah in order to be among the strangers because you will see a lot of difference. And wallahi we are seeing some of that today. So then, the sunnah I'm going to give you a very conclusive definition. So we will not elaborate due to the time. Whatever he did, sallallahu alayhi wa you do. Whatever he did not do, although he was able to do, you do not do. See how easy it is? What did he do? You do. Whatever he did not do, although he had the ability, 23 years receiving revelation, he had the chance to do something, all these lives, we have no narration that he did it, that means that you're not supposed to do it, so you do not do it. That's it. That way, you will never have to innovate anything. You follow what came before you. Everything has been laid down, put in books, tapes, everything you need. All you have to do is follow. Follow and you will be successful. Follow, you will be on the lifeboat. Follow, you will not be on the ship. Follow, you will not drown. Lastly, the last condition is that the Prophet ﷺ has no share in divinity. He does have no share in divinity. And this is for the, those among the Muslims who go all the way from their country to the Medina, to the Masjid al-Nabawi, not to pray there, to visit the Prophet ﷺ. To go make dua to him. Make dua to him. You've seen them. You find guards. Tell them, go away from here. You come all the way from the other side of the world to commit shirk. Don't you know that Allah commanded the Prophet ﷺ to say in the Quran, قُلْ إِنِّي لَا أَمْلِكُ لَكُمْ ضَرًّا وَلَا رَشَدًا Say, I do not possess for you any harm or any good guidance except by the will of Allah. قُلْ إِنِّي لَا يُجِيرَنِي مِنَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Say, I, no one will be able to protect me from Allah. This is the reality of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. During his life, he could have interceded for those who sought intercession. He could have asked Allah to forgive them because his dua was accepted. Today, it's over. You may send peace and blessings upon him if you want a shafa'a. There are things that are from within the teachings of Islam which you may do. But to go and ask him to do things, to supplicate to him, to make him equal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is exactly what Islam came to destroy. This is what shirk is. This is what the people of Noah were doing. This is what the people of Ibrahim were doing. This is what everyone was doing. Having intercessors with Allah. Intermediaries, people that they use in between to get them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet came to teach us that you go direct. So then, we do not, we do not dedicate any form of worship to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu we know that during his life, he could have benefited the believers because of his status with Allah. Today, it's over. These, my brothers in Islam and sisters, are the six conditions of the shahada that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa As I promised you in the beginning, now is the time for evaluation, self-evaluation. Each one of us. Let us measure ourselves according to these six. Where are we from them? Where are we from them? Are we anywhere close? Only Allah knows. If we're not, سَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Hasten to the forgiveness of your Lord. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ All you who you believe, all of you, repent to Allah. We repent to Allah from our shortcomings, from disobeying Him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from ignoring His statement, His advice. He was so concerned about us. He said, really my example and your example is like a man who kindled some fire. 
And then these flies, you know the mosquitoes and all these flies that come attracted to the fire, they start rushing towards the fire and I'm standing there trying to prevent them but they keep passing me. He was so concerned that me and you don't go to Jahannam. And some of us want to go to Jahannam. Striving to go to Jahannam but outwardly we say we're trying to go to Jannah. We will not really be among the strangers, the Akhwan and sisters, brothers and sisters unless we follow the Sunnah in the ultimate sense. So we can be among the strangers. Those who rectify when the people go corrupt. Those who revive the sunnah when the people abandon it. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his beautiful names and ultimate attributes to make each and every one of us here among those. And to make us among those who revive the sunnah, live according to the sunnah, die upon the sunnah. If you do so, wallahi success. فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأَدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاسِ Whomever has moved away from the fire and permitted to Jannah has attained success. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَ عَنْ حَمْدُ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمَ وَبَارَكَ عَلَى نَبِيَنَ مُحَمَّدٍ If you have any questions or... The brother was advising me to be honest. He said that I'm, I'm being a little too excited. And you know, this is what usually the sunnah when you do khutbah. During the khutbah, Rasulullah used to get excited. His eyes will get red, his voice will get loud. And he's reminding, he's reminding me that this is not a khutbah. Zala uh, khairan. I hope that I did not, you know, scare any one of you away. But the intent is to, we need to wake up. You know, let's be honest with you. You know, sometimes your son, you know, you have children. You know, you, be, you tell him, listen, huh, stop doing this, stop doing this, you know, six, seven times. He doesn't really listen at you, say, hey. Then he says, huh. So similarly, sometimes we Muslims need a little wake-up call. So I'm not trying to scare you away, but I'm trying to just, you know, make sure that we understand these things and that they go from the heart to the heart. So if I, I scared anyone, forgive me. I'm not that scary. It's small size. Uh, Allah is our sustainer. Why did we work? Why did we work but we get our daily need? Why don't we stay indoor and wait for the sustenance of Allah? Oh, we were just dealing with this uh, recently. Uh, it doesn't make any sense that, I mean, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the razzaq, the, the, also the sustainer, the one who provides continuously to his creation. But, you know, no uh, rightly, uh, right-minded person will think that he would be able to get sustenance unless he strives. I mean, do you want to get a degree from a school without going to school? So I'm just going to go stay in school and somehow one day they're going to email it to me or something along these lines. I say, you have to go to school, strive. So the Prophet ﷺ, he had a man ask him, he had a camel. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, do I leave my camel untied and do tawakkul on Allah? He said, no, tie your camel and then depend on Allah. Which means you must utilize the means, huh? then you do tawakkul. Prophet ﷺ said, if you depend on Allah the, way, the right way, you'll be just like the bird. It goes away in the morning with an empty stomach, it comes back full. Did he say it remains in his nest? He said it goes away in the morning. It goes to go seek rizq. And it comes back, Allah gives you rizq. So you must strive. We believe that Allah is the sustainer. But we do the work to get the sustenance. Otherwise it's not going to come. I'm, I'm sure this is clear inshallah. Is it allowed to buy a car through bank installment facility? You need a fatwa from the ulama. And this is not my business. There are many fatwa. I could refer you to some, some fatwa if you wish. Uh, it depends on the kind of the contract, kind of contract and the installment. There's a lot of things that are to be discussed. But if you're able to buy a car that is not as fancy as the one you're looking forward to, but it will get you from point A to point B without having to deal with this, then this will be much better. Leave that which you are doubtful about to that which gives you comfort and no doubt. Of course, maybe if you have too much money, you insist on having a nice car. That's none of my business. But just a suggestion. Otherwise, I'm not saying it's haram to buy a car through installments. Maybe some of the brothers came here with a car through installments saying this. So I'm not saying that what you're doing is wrong, but there's a difference of opinion among the scholars, and you need to refer that to the ulama. Uh, how can we rectify the sunnah which is optional and obligatory, such as growing the beard? Ouch! Uh, well, actually, there's no alim who is qualified, as far as I know, just let's say the four a'imma, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, Imam Shafi'i, and all of the a'imma of the rightly uh, guided, righteous predecessors, there was no difference of opinion that the man keeping his beard is an obligation. 
It's an obligation, not an option. For many, many, many reasons and many, many, many narrations. There are more than one narration of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly commanded and we are dealing with obeying him. He said, خَالِفُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ أَوْ الْمَجُوسِ اَعْفُ الشَّوَارِبْ وَعْفُ الْلِحَى Trim your mustache and let your beard grow. So this is a command. وَالْأَصْلِ فِي الْأَمْرِ الْوُجُوبِ In the qawaid, in the, in, the, in the deen, the principle regarding the commandments is that it is obligatory. Unless you have an evidence which indicates otherwise. And in this particular case, we have no such evidence. No such evidence that it is optional, this is from the matters of the dunya, this is from the matters of the deen. I will give you around seven violations that are a by, byproduct or the consequence of shaving the beard. Any brother who doesn't have a beard now, don't worry about it. Please, we are all sinners. I may have a beard and have a sin 20 times, you not having a beard. Okay, so I don't want anyone to feel any kind of offense or think I'm picking on you. Allah knows what the hearts conceal. Each one of us is a sinner. Al-ibra bit-tawbah. If you repent to Allah, then you affairs with Allah. Whatever you did today, it doesn't matter. If Allah forgives you, who are we not to forgive? But we have to say the truth. This is the deen of Allah. When you shave your beard, you're disobeying Allah. The Prophet ﷺ had two convoys come to him from the king of Persia. They had no mustache, no beard, and a big mustache. When he seen them, he disliked looking at them. He did not even want to look at them. He said, Man amarakum bihada? Who commanded you to do that? They said, Our Lord, our Lord, Tisra, our Lord, the Persian king. He said, Well, my Lord, my Lord commanded me to let my beard grow and to trim my mustache. So he said, Allah commanded him, meaning when we shave the beard, we are disobeying Allah. Then, you dis- then the second violation is you are disobeying the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam Because he told you in the narration I quoted earlier, let your beard grow. The third violation, you're going against the way of life of the Prophets and the Messengers. Harun, when, when he was with the pe- children of Israel and Musa went to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to receive the, the, the commandments huh? the, for the 40 days and they made the calf and they started worshipping it. When Musa came back and found him in the stage, he became angry with Harun, thought that he didn't do his job, so he grabbed him by his hair and his lihya, and it comes in the Quran. Harun said, لا تأخذ بلحيتي Don't grab me by my beard. Which means that Harun, the brother of Musa, had a beard. And the Prophet when he described the, the, the prophets and the messengers, they had beards. And all of the righteous predecessors had beards. So the third violation, you're going against them. Although you say every day in the Fatiha, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ The path of those whom you have bestowed your favors upon. Who are they? النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ So it's the same ones. The prophets, the truthful ones, the martyrs and the scholars, and the righteous people. So we ask for the guidance and then we go against it. This is called contradiction. We are contradicting ourselves. Fourthly, imitating the disbelievers. This is the quality of the disbelievers to, to you know, decorate themselves in this fashion and shave the beard and things of the sort. And we, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَوَمِنْهُمْ Whomever resembles a group of people, he's just one of them. He's just one of them, not one of us. I don't know about that, this is dangerous. Fifthly, imitating women. They were created without facial hair, and we were created with facial hair. When we remove that, then we are resembling them. And Prophet ﷺ cursed the men who resemble women and the women who resemble men. So then we have the curse. If you have a curse, attardu ar rahmatillah, meaning you are kicked away, you are deprived of the mercy of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, none of you will enter Jannah through his deeds. They said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, not even me, unless Allah encompasses me with his mercy. So without no, no Jannah, even the Prophet ﷺ without mercy. When you have Lana, you have no mercy. Meaning you're in trouble. You say, Akhi, all this because of some facial hair? Say no. You may have only one hair that grows, but it's the ta'ah. It's the obedience. Because you are obeying. You are following. And when you shave it, it's not about the number of hair. It's the fact that you are not taking the Prophet ﷺ as your example to be followed. And that is an issue with the needless to say. And lastly, it's extravagance. The Gillette three razor blade is like 58 riyals. Crazy price! And you know, a lot of money being spent daily 
you know, and a lot of time is being wasted. You could be, you know, memorizing the narrations, but you may spend 20-50 minutes uh, in, in, your, in the bathroom trying to make sure that you know, everything is nice and clean. So you're wasting time and you're wasting money. Had you let, the easiest thing in the world is to let your beard grow because you don't have to do anything. You don't have to water it, huh? like a plant. You don't, you, all you have to do, leave it alone. No effort, just leave it alone, yes, yes. They call you mutawwi' ma'alish. You want to be a stranger? Let it be. Let them call you whatever they want to call you. Who cares what the people think? This is for Allah, not for the creation. So this is just, I know this is sensitive, but I had to do this. So anyone who was offended, ask Allah to forgive me for offending you. I didn't mean to do that, but Allah knows I will be fake, I'll be a liar, I will not be your brother for real unless I tell you the truth. And similarly, the same way the brother seen that I was being too violent, he told me, hey brother, you better take it easy. I respect that because I make mistakes and I should, I should accept the advice of my brother. I should believe that he wants goodness for me. I don't think he's trying to criticize me. He wants goodness for me. And when we say these things, we want goodness for each other. Otherwise, I see you every day, I don't tell you. You know, sometimes we do that on purpose, but Allah always gives us away. Sometimes you want to tell the brother, but you're afraid he will get scared. So Allah is so merciful that the message gets delivered in a lecture. Where I don't have to tell anyone one on one. Huh? You get to tell more than one person at the same time. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Hey, can you please give us the surah and the verse, the number of the verses specified to look in Ibn Kathir? Yes, I can, insha'Allah. Surah An-Nur, verse 63. Uh, is insurance permissible in Islam? Oof. Again, a lot of breakdown. The asal is insurance is haram because it's a form of gambling. And I will make it very simple for you. I used to be an insurance salesman. Not in this country, somewhere else in my jahiliyyah. Before pre-Islamic uh, days. Let me tell you what Islam... First of all, the insurance company I worked for, you know how much money they paid back from the money they made from the people? 3%. 3%. 97%? Inside. Inside. 97% from the money they make, they only pay back 3%. What is insurance? I don't know if you know gambling, you know, the casino, they have this, what do they call the black uh, jack or one of these games, one of these, or whatever, anyways, you say, uh, I want 40 reals on number 45, huh, gambling, 40 reals on number 45, he throw the dice, huh, or whatever the thing, if it comes on 45, you will make 500 reals, if it doesn't come on 45, what happens to you 45 reals, you 40 reals, gone. That's insurance. I'm going to pay you this money a month. If something happens to me, you'll cover me for 20,000 million riyals in the hospital. If nothing happens to me, he'll take the money. Is there any difference between them? No. And that's what the scholars have said. It is just a form of gambling because it deals with uncertainty. Any uncertainty in Islam, any Islamic transaction that deals with uncertainty is haram. Because everything should be clear. Anyways, these required fatawa of the scholars. I'm only giving you an extract, a brief, uh, the juice yani, of the thing. Otherwise, you need to read extensively about these things because there are differences of opinions. There are exceptions to the rule that you, know, you need to ask those who are qualified. Whoa. The, you, the brothers are okay? Continue? Yeah. I'm so sorry. This is a long question. It's in Arabic. كلنا يؤمن أن النجاة بالإيمان بالله Okay, this is just, I guess, a reminder that uh, regarding the people of the book that, you know, the, the, the attitude was that any time a messenger came to them they wind up, you know, worshipping others uh, other than Allah with, with you know, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever it is. He said, and similarly, uh, the, the, some of the Muslims today are doing the same thing. You know, they were called to Tawheed. Uh, this is what I understood from this. I may, I may be wrong. We called to Tawheed, and now they continue to, you know, worship the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam along with Allah. Although the very reason why the previous religions were abrogated and destroyed, because they brought shirk into their belief system. Otherwise, there will be no need for new revelation. So Muslims cannot follow these footsteps. This is what I understand and I may very much be very mistaken about what the person intended with this. 
جزاكم الله خيرا and جزاك الله خيرا is wearing ring for men allowable yes you may wear a ring that is not gold okay but not to show off because a muslim is supposed to be humble because some people want to wear a ring and you know try to this is not the quality of a believer number one number two there's no such thing as wedding ring engagement ring wedding ring this is actually a, a, a habit from the christians they have developed it and it, it has a meaning with them they believe that this ring that you wear huh, will keep your connection with your wife it will make this relationship uh, maintained it's like the it's like the link although this is shirk because we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who controls these things so it actually has a significance in their religion and it is not from the habits of the Muslims to have wedding rings or dibla whatever they call it nowadays I don't I don't know but there's no such thing as wedding ring engagement ring okay you know and there's a fatwa by one of the ulama regarding this issue he dealt with it extensively it falls under imitating the disbelievers and there's no basis for that in our deen so in case you have one you could just maybe move it to another finger so it doesn't look like because usually they wear it in this one right and they move it from if engagement in the one hand and when you become married in the right hand all these are from not from the muslims not from the muslims and we are asked to distinguish ourselves from the kuffar not to imitate them ring a ring generally now that's a whole other story it, it's the wedding part of the ring not the ring the ring is okay but the wedding hey خلاص طيب see you next time inshallah if we all stay alive nowadays you, you don't guarantee did you hear about the plane in New York yeah. a plane was flying and it landed in someone's house and killed him did you ever think you'll be sitting in your own house and a plane will come in and this will be the end of you Allah now you see wonders yani this it tells you that you may go anytime now we say I'll see you next time maybe we will not so we should always be ready for that inshallah subhanakallahumma bihamdik shalala ilaha 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 ilaha